Hey, I'm Dan Harris. I am a fidgety, skeptical newsman who had a panic attack live on Good Morning America. To prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. That led me to something I always thought was ridiculous, meditation. I wrote a book about it, launched an app, and now I'm starting this podcast to try to figure out if there's anything beyond 10%. Basically, here's what I'm obsessed with. Can you be an ambitious person who is nonetheless striving for enlightenment, whatever that means? Let's start the show. All right, so I just want to say this, which is that if you had told the 1994 version of me that I'd ever be sitting and talking to Rivers Cuomo from Weezer, I would have freaked out um, because I'm a huge, long-time, old-school fan of you and your work. Um, I have everything you've ever made, and uh, I love all of it. And so it's a huge thrill to be sitting and talking to you. Oh, thanks a lot. And even weirder that we're sitting to talk about, well, we're going we're to talk about your music and your new record, which is coming out, but we're also ca- talking a lot about meditation, which is a combination that if, again, if you had told the 1994 me, I would have been like, that's <laughs> awesome, but weird. Um, you are actually the first public figure with whom I relate that I ever even learned was into meditation. I was reading an article about you, I think in like 2005, and it mentioned that you were meditating in a closet or something like that. And I thought, okay, this guy's lost his mind. This is way before I ever started meditating. And Mm. um, so, which leads me to my first question was when and how did you start meditating? Well, first of all, I was meditating in school when I was a kid. Um, My family was living on the Satchitananda Ashram in Pomfret, Connecticut. And every day we'd I don't know, maybe five minutes of mantra meditation. It seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only a couple minutes. Um, and then I switched to public school in sixth grade, and of course I stopped doing it. And, you know, every now and then when I was in a crisis situation, I'd, I'd remember to do some mantra work to calm myself down. And, um, it was cool that I still had that instinct to do that when push came to shove. Can you just define, for those, there may be some people who don't want to know what a mantra is. Oh. Can you just describe uh, what that is? Yeah, well, um, it's just some phrase you repeat over and over in your mind um, that helps to concentrate your mind and ca- calm you down. Uh, often it's a Sanskrit phrase, and uh, I'm sure that the, I was, I got some Sanskrit phrase from um, Satchitananda. This is probably probably like 1977 or something when I was a little kid. What, what, what is Sachi? Who is Sachi? He was the, um, the guru from India who came and did the opening talk at the Woodstock Festival. That's how most Americans would know him. Um, but then he, he set up ashrams um, at several places around the world, including one in Connecticut. And uh, my parents were first involved with the Rochester Zen Center, which is actually where they met. And then when I was three or four, they le- um, they split up from each other, and my mom ended up at the ashram in Connecticut, and um, that's where I spent a good part of my childhood. So she went from sort of a Buddhist situation to a Hindu situation? Yeah, and it, it's not like Orthodox Hinduism. It was very reform. Um, so there wasn't a heck of a lot of like worshiping blue multi-armed gods um but you know the central um central components of morality um karma yoga working for others and meditation and yoga where that was part of our daily life so you you had a kind of like groovy hippie upbringing didn't you yeah it's weird is that i remember asking my parents um when I was a kid, are, are you guys hippies? And they, w- they would always say no. They didn't identify with hippies. But then later I looked back on it, and it's like, you know, it seems like you guys are pretty much hippies. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they fall four square into the hippie category. Yeah. Um, you raise your kid on an ashram it sounds, in the 70s, it sounds pretty hippie. Yeah. Um, I guess they got into all this stuff before the word hippie was in Time Magazine, though, and it, it they didn't associate it with being a hippie, it was like it was a more seri- a serious spiritual endeavor. And um, so I think they, they didn't like being labeled that later on. But so 
it's unclear to me how much of this stuff really took root in you because as I understand it, as you got into high school, you really got into metal and, um, and then you formed Weezer after high school. So, and you weren't meditating daily, right? That's right. I wasn't meditating in, until I was 32 and it was actually the music that brought me back because I felt like uh, my my inspiration, my creativity was drying up, and I I needed, I tried everything else. I needed to t- do something drastic. Meditation seemed like the last thing that was going to help me f- feel creative again. But um, I tried everything else, and it was recommended to me by someone I tr- I respected very much, Rick Rubin, who was producing our record at the time. So I finally came around to it and tried it again, and immediately I recognized that it was. It got me back in the right direction. I've been doing it ever since. What kind of meditation did you do when you started again? Um, let's see. I was just kind of dabbling around here and there. Um, I, I didn't pick up a mantra again. Uh, I, th- I think I was drawn to um, more b- meditation on the breath. You know what? I think I first l- heard about that in a book on uh, uh, nin- ninjas when I was maybe 13 um, is, is uh, like a, some book on the black arts of the ninjas and you know how to how to kill people with one move or that sort of thing I was really interested in that um, but anyway it said Can the you way do that uh, no no I you can't think. focus on the breath <laughs> but it said the way the ninjas would meditate is by observing their breath and counting their breath up to nine and then starting again so I probably started like that and um, I did, I read a few books and I, um, well, shoot, oh, I can't remember that guy's name, but he was like a Tibetan Buddhist uh, meditation teacher. He's not t- Tibetan, but that's his style of meditation. Lama Surya Das? No. Um, no. Robert oh, Thurman? No, 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 no. It's, uh, uh, I can't remember. Last name starts with an M, if that's helpful. We'll get there. We'll, we'll think yeah. of it. Um, but I read his book and on an intellectual level, it made a lot of sense to me. And that's when I started realizing that meditation might help me. And so I went to his, one of his retreats. Um, it was at Mount Baldy here in the LA area. And, uh, every day he would teach a different technique. So it was kind of like a buffet. I was trying out different things. And I think it was day two. Um, he taught what was essentially Vipassana. It was observing sensations on the body and, Um, I immediately loved it and it was like a bell went off and I was like, this is, this is it. I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta figure out how to dive into this a hundred percent. And so I just started asking around and looking online and I found the, the website for SN Goenka and noticed that he has centers all around the world and signed up for, for a course. And, um, that was 2003 and I've been doing it ever since every year I go and every day I practice that same technique. So, again, for the uninitiated, and I'm not an expert in S.N. Goenka, but he was a businessman, an Indian businessman, as, as far as I, as I understand it, who learned how to meditate from a monk in Burma and then yeah, um, started teaching people all over the world? Yeah, he's Indian uh, Hindu, but he grew up in Burma <clears throat> and surrounded by um, Burmese Buddhists. And, um, he, you know, he, he hung on. He, he hung on to his uh, Orthodox Hindu beliefs as, as long as he could, but then um, he, he was having terrible problem with migraine headaches. He was getting treated um, by doctors around the world, um, taking morphine, that sort of thing, and nothing was really helping him come out of that or deal with that. So eventually he, he ended up trying Vipassana and, uh, and recognized that it was helping and went went all in and um eventually became a teacher himself and then went back to india and started teaching it there um it really the technique really exploded there and then from there started traveling around the world maybe around 1980 he got to the u.s um, started a center there and and then i found it 2003 and you went kind of all in as, as i understand it yep um in fact even before i sat my first course, I was already signed up for a second one a few weeks later. I just had this sense that it was going to work and, and it did. So, um, yeah, every year I've, I've sat at least 30 days, sometimes as much as 50 or 60 days. Still? Um, yeah. Well, this year I'm going to do 20. 
it's the first year I'm, I'm downgrading. Um, yeah, just, uh, want to, want to spend a little more time with my family. And, and well, I was just going to ask about it. you have a wife, you've been married for almost 10 years and you have two kids, eight, eight and four. Yeah. How do you do that volume of retreat time? You know, you said before north of 30 days historically, and then this year you're quote unquote downgrading to 20. That's still a lot of retreat time. And, and is your wife cool with it? Yeah, she is. She's supportive. Um, in fact, she does it herself. She does 10 days. Um, but, uh, it's definitely, I think it's been the most difficult thing I encounter, uh, on these courses is like worrying about my family and worrying if I should even be there. Um, am I doing the responsible thing? And, uh, I and that's why I'm, I'm going down to 20 this year. I think it's going to be better. Well, I had a baby, um, in, uh, December so about 14, 15 months ago and uh, our first kid and I did a retreat um, about nine or 10 months after that and my first one since he was born, it was a 10 or 11 day retreat in Massachusetts and man, I was just, it was a big thing for me. It just kept coming up how much I missed him and yeah. I would do walking meditation outside but I, I had his baby blanket that I used as a scarf. I could kind of smell him um, and I don't know if that was a good or bad move because I was really thinking about him a lot. And, and so to do 20 or 30 days, just sort of navigating the politics of that my, with my wife and my job and, and missing him, it just seems like a lot. Yeah, I mean, you, you got you to gotta know that your family supports you and, and your wife supports you. You can't, I mean, that's one of the things when you go to take one of these courses with SN Goenka, there's an application you have to fill out and it says there's a question on there is, is your wife's or is your partner supporting you? Does your family support you? Um, and if you say no, then you know that the teachers are going to talk to you. Like maybe this isn't the right time to be taking this course. Mm. Cause yeah, you need, you need to know that you're supported and, and your family believes you're doing the right thing. Cause it's such a hard thing to do. You don't want to have that hanging over your head. No, no. I mean, I've been lucky that my wife has been incredibly supportive and it sounds like you have been too. You to get back to something you said earlier, though, that you you knew it was going to work and it did. What do you mean by work? How does it work for you? Well, the goal was to write better songs, and it, you know, I felt like I was I had really bottomed out around two thousand two after you know, third and fourth album, and um, didn't wasn't coming up with anything. And then I came out of the I came out of the course and started meditating every day and going back to courses and serving at the center and the ideas just started flowing. And, um, you know, it's hard to, to measure, uh, success. I mean, I can point to the record we put out uh, after and say, um, it's so, um, a song was nominated for a Grammy or it was a, you know, a giant, the, the first mil, million seller on iTunes, that sort of thing. That was make-believe, right? Yeah, but that's commercial su success, and that's one metric. Um, other people could say, well, look, it got really bad reviews, so can you really say meditation was working for you? And um, Did it get bad reviews? Yeah. I mean, most of our records get bad reviews. Not the last one. <laughs> True, that was the best-reviewed record we ever got. Um, so, I mean, I even hesitate to say, look, see what med meditation's working. I can prove it. Look at the sales figure or this review or whatever it is. Um, but I know, I just know in my heart that if, if I wasn't meditating, um, it's, I don't know if I could, if I would even be coming up with anything at this point. It's rare that for an, for a, um, rock musician to be able to keep putting out new music, um, that that feels exciting to to anyone at um, this late stage in a career. So I don't know. I give I give the practice some credit. What about for you as just like a, a dude, a, a husband, a dad, a bandmate? Do you think it's changed the way you are in the world? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, it's been what what did I say? Two thousand three. So that's thirteen years. I probably would have changed a ton anyway. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you just have to take my word. Like, I don't know if I ever could have gotten married without this meditation practice to settle me down and get me focused on my core values. Um, you know, I had, I had a real problem committing to anybody or, 
um, I, as much as I wanted a relationship, I just, I, I just would get, you know, dissatisfied and move on. Um, so, you know, I feel like without the practice, I wouldn't be married. I wouldn't have these kids. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to hang in there. Um, and then again, it's like, man, how long has this band been together? 20, 24 years now. That's, uh, that marriage in, itself. in and of itself. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, that's something to be proud of. And it's, it's very hard to keep that thing going, that four way marriage going. And I don't know, I give, I give the practice some, from credit, um, some credit for, uh, keeping me calm through any difficulties that come up and, um, w- w- willing to compromise and, and not like do make some stupid move, which is what I w- would have done before. I mean, I've read, and I don't even know if the, these articles that I've read or have any veracity to them, so you can you can just set the record straight. But I've read that sometimes the, the relationships among the band members have been pretty tough. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And do you think it's improved as a consequence of your having this practice in your life? I do. And again, it's hard to say, like, maybe we we would have grown up and matured and become cool with each other anyway. But I feel like the practice, um, it's its only accelerated that process and prevented me from doing something stupid, like saying, screw you guys, I don't need you, I'm going to go make a solo record, that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and I, I, I do feel like the toughest times are, are far behind us now, and we really enjoy each other, and we, we're working well together. So what is your practice like now? How much meditating are you doing every day? Well, Goenka's requirement is two hours a day, so an hour in the morning, hour in the evening. I've done that every day since 2003, except for one day in 2009 when our tour bus crashed. And you got pretty badly hurt, if I recall. Yeah. So I was unconscious that day. That's a pretty good excuse. Yeah. But you did the two hours the next day when you woke yeah. up in the hospital? in the hospital bed. So that is a, a staggering level of commitment. I, I I know you've derived a lot of benefits for it, but I'm just curious if you can just explore again for me, like, what is driving you to do that, to just keep doing it every day? I'm sure there are bad days where you don't want to put your butt on the cushion. So what is motivating you to keep going with this thing? Well, I've never had a problem at all because from day one, it was about the music and the creativity, being an artist. And that's been the most important thing to me. And uh, I know meditation is the best possible thing for my creativity. So, uh, yeah, it's no problem. And still for you, the driver is creativity. Well, hmm. I, yeah, I wonder about that. Like, pretty early on, within a, y- a year or two, I, I recognized like I was getting all these other benefits that I didn't think I cared about. But yeah, I guess if if you if I guess somehow got fired and and uh, I was not allowed to write any more music or put out any more music, would I still meditate? I think at this point, I think I would. It's like, hmm, whatever it is I'm doing, it's gonna end up better if I'm sitting. If I'm sitting two hours a day, and if I go to these courses every year, whatever I'm doing is going to be better. Would you describe yourself now as a Buddhist? No. No? No. Do you think, because the school in which you're studying, Goenka's school, is clearly Buddhist. Uh, no, he, it's not. Um, no, uh, he, makes, he makes a point uh, to no. not, not call himself a Buddhist. I yeah. stand corrected. Um, so do you think about things like enlightenment? You I don't. A, you got a Buddha in the bathroom, I didn't notice. Oh, uh, no, that's just for fun. Okay. Um, no, I don't, I, I mean, if, if practicing this much didn't give me any benefit in the moment, it was all about someday becoming enlightened, uh, that I, could, I could, wouldn't have the discipline to do. I sit every day because every day when I get up from sitting, it's like, wow, I feel so much better. Mm. So it's not, well, I mean, I guess the argument around enlightenment, and I'm certainly not an expert, but I'm deeply, deeply curious about it, is uh, you're never going to get enlightened in the future because everything happens right now. 
So whenever you get enlightened, it'll, it's going to be right now. <laughs> uh, so it's like waking up to this thing that's very hard to see, but is always right here. Um, I find that idea intriguing. Uh, and that, in fact, I find to be a motivator. I don't know if I can explain it better than I just did, or because or, I'm sure there's a lot more to it. But it doesn't seem like that's really on your radar screen. Not at all. It's just about creativity, better relationships. It's working thus far. Why stop it? Yep. Do you, fi- do you find, you said there was no problem for you in the two hours a day, but I, I about six months ago, I went to two hours a day, in part because I <laughs> because I talked to you um, and a few other people I knew who had done two hours a day. And with my schedule, I and I know you have a crazy schedule too, especially when you're on the road. Um, it's hard. You know, I'm, I've given myself the leeway, which you have not, of, of just, I can sit in whatever increments I want. So sometimes I'll do a 75 minute, 80 minute sit. And then other times I'll do five minute or 10 minute and I, I just string it together. Yeah, I've started doing that too. Oh, you have? Yeah. Okay. Because I find that makes it much easier, scheduling wise. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, me too. Like, I'll, I can sl- sleep, I can wake up whenever I wake up. I don't have to set an alarm. And then I can sit as much as I can before the kids wake up. And then I, um, I can stop and I can spend some time with them, get them off to school. And then I can finish my sitting. And what about when you're on tour? Well, first of all, let me correct you. I don't have a crazy schedule. You don't? No. Okay. I have a, I mean, I have a very chill schedule. Oh, that's awesome. And, and I like it that way, yeah. I would like it that way, too. <laughs> um, so on tour, well, you know, we haven't really been touring. Um, this summer is going to be our first major tour in years. It's also going to be our longest, craziest, biggest tour ever. Um, so... You know, you just say at the beginning, all right, I'm going to meditate an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, and then everything else has to go around that. And there's not much else that needs to get done. Sound check, the show, an interview maybe, hang out with the family. Well, because I'm guessing you're not doing a lot of the things that take up a a huge chunk of time on the itinerary of most rock stars, which is cocaine and, you know, heroin uh, and just and and hanging out with roadies. (laughs) So you do have more time than the average uh, rock musician, I would imagine. Yeah. And what Goenka says I found to be true is that um, once you start meditating that much, your time becomes... You make much better use of your time. You're not just lying around watching TV or whatever. It's uh, you just feel more focused and you get a lot more done in the time you have. I totally agree with that. I thought there was no way I was going to be able to get two hours a day in, and then the, the time just opens up. And now, if I'm lying around watching TV with my wife, it's because that's what we want to do at that time. It, um, but it's almost like this is maybe a stupid analogy, but when you play as a kid in high school, if you play a sport. Even though it's taken up a huge chunk of your time, your life just has an order to it, mm, um, yeah. And that's that's the impact I've found. Yeah. Um, the, you said you're not a Buddhist, and so maybe this question doesn't make any sense. But I, I've noted that you have a, a real theme in your social media postings of skeletons, mm-hmm. which which to me, as as somebody I guess who would describe himself as a Buddhist, has a lot of resonance about yeah. impermanence and things like that. Is are you? Is is the skeleton thing unrelated to any of the things we're talking about, or does it go to the core of it? Oh, yeah. Um, I, my skeleton's back there. I think I got that skeleton after the bus accident, actually. Um, I wanted to see exactly where I had broken bones, and it's just very interesting to me. And as I, as I have other injuries going forward, I'll be able to look on the skeleton and see where they are. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, meditating 20, 30, 45 days, you, you start to become aware of, of, of your skeleton and uh, the inside of your body, especially like doing Vipassana, you're, you're observing sensations, you're observing your body, and you're aware of all, of all the change and um, the, the decay and the, the anicca, you know that word, the, yes. the constant change. Um, Dropping. I'm never. This is the first podcast in which somebody's used a, a word from the Pali language. So that's good. Anicca <laughs> we'll means get used to it. Anicca means impermanence in Pali. Yes, the language of the Buddha. Yeah, and and there even was a technique uh, technique that the Buddha taught to some students where they would go to the charnel ground and yeah. and just look at all these dead bodies yeah. in various states of decay, and you know especially for those 
guys that were having trouble like being attracted to to women and getting sexually aroused all the time it makes it hard to meditate just think about you know the reality of what's there um that beauty's skin deep and um and then he would just list all the various disgusting uh ingredients in the body and so it's yeah it's nice to think about that from time to time keep your perspective there's some story about i don't know i'm not going to be able to nail this but there was a story about some monk back in the buddha's time was walking through the forest and um he uh he had walked some a beautiful woman had run by him yeah who was running away from her husband and the husband finds the monk and says did you see my beautiful wife and he said i don't know but a bag of bones passed passed this way recently that's the story i was thinking of thank you um I don't, I, I don't think I nailed the story, but you know what I'm talking about roughly. Exactly, yeah. So, but, so I'm down with a skeleton for sure, but some people, I assume, listening to this or watching this would probably think, well, that's really mor- morbid. <laughs> How would you respond to that? Well, morbid is a, it's a, an emotional reaction to some bones or some uh, you know, atoms or molecules that are, are there. You don't necessarily have to have that particular emotional reaction. There's many reactions you could have. But it is, my response would be, it is the truth. We don't want to think about it, and we, we sequester our elderly away in nursing homes, yeah. and uh, at funerals we paint the body um, to make it look alive. Um, yeah. But we are in these fragile, impermanent bodies yeah. that are made up of all sorts of, uh, I think, fluids and things <laughs> like that that most of us find disgusting. When, but it, it, it is the truth, the undeniable truth that we don't want to look at. It's kind of like asking a cat to look in the mirror. You know, if you ever try to do that with a cat or a dog, they won't look. Um, huh. But we won't look at this fundamental truth. And the skeleton is a reminder. Yeah. And even more fundamental beneath that is the, uh, the subatomic particles arising and passing away. And that, that's all it is. Yeah, got to keep it in mind. Do you do you keep it? Do you find that you are able to keep it in mind? Well, no, not not in my daily life. But um, that is what the meditation practice is. That's what vipassana is. Um, it's actually not thinking about it um, on an intellectual level, but actually feeling it, uh, feeling as much as as much detail as you can of your physical sensations. You you, I mean, it's just obvious to me sitting here. Um, listening to you that you've derived an enormous amount of benefit from the practice but you also said you were using it in in service of creativity and in your art is rock music generally thought of as a young person's game sort of angsty and you were arguably the progenitor of emo music you know your your music especially pinkerton your second album sometimes people point to that as like the first true emo uh, album um so it was all about unhappiness and uh, sexual attraction and um one of your songs is tired of sex um and sort of sexual attraction or lack thereof uh, all sorts of twitchy, itchy um, stuff that comes along with being in your early 20s. And now you're in your mid-40s. You meditate two hours a day. You go on retreat for weeks. Uh, that would seem to be the, sort of the enemy of rock music. So yeah. I, talk to me how those two fit. Tell me about how those two fit together. Well, that's exactly why I didn't want to try meditation in the first place, and why, why it took me so long. It seemed like the last thing that could possibly help me make better rock music Um but I was willing to give it a try. And what can I say? It helped. And I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, it definitely improves your concentration. And creativity, even in rock music, is about concentration. It's about fighting through whatever internal struggles there are, self-doubt, um, and really focusing in on what it is you're trying to say, um, even if it's about... Uh, something that appears to be immoral or whatever, you know, it's, you got to focus in on it and describe it. And that's what Pinkerton was all about. So, and and to find the words for that. And so meditation has helped me do that. Um, But if, if Pinkerton was legitimately, I mean, it just comes through. I mean, I would just listen, I just re listened to it recently. It just comes through in every note of it, how, you know, you were in a bad place around that record. It's, you can hear it, um, but you're in a, at least 
to my eyes, you seem to be in a great place right now. Uh, you're in your mid-40s, beautiful wife, wonderful kids, meditation practice that seems to have improved your relationships on every level of your life. So how can you write tortured rock music in your current state? Um, well, maybe this is one of the things I first uh, picked up from that book I read by McLeod. McLeod. Oh, Ken McLeod. Ken, yeah. I know Ken McLeod. Yeah. Thank you. So it was in that book. Um, I think he was saying something like, yeah, you can take drugs or you can um, get yourself into all these crazy dramatic situations. So, you know, these emo situations. So you have something to write about, but these are just, or, or so that you feel high, but these are just peak experiences and then they pass and then you feel blah again. Or you can meditate and sharpen your mind so that you can get more out of subtler disturbances. And so I, I am not, enlightened or um, free from those the same kind of emotions I had as uh, when I was in my mid 20s writing Pinkerton I still I'm still the same person um, you know maybe it's not as intense or maybe I know how to deal with it but now I can look at them and I, I don't I don't necessarily need to stoke them as fires so uh, to have something to write about I can just observe them as they are and write about them and maybe um uh, you know coming through the speakers it sounds like a, maybe it sounds more like there's more tumult in my life than you think there is when you're sitting here um across from me but i don't know it's still um, first of all, let me. You got to hear the new record. You haven't heard the new record yet. I've right? heard some of the You've songs. Some, yeah. some of the songs are up on iTunes as as we speak, um, and they're great. Yeah. King of the World. Yeah. Um, there's still, I mean, there's still plenty of emotional disturbances for me to write about. So I love what you're saying because, I mean, I'm a guy who wrote a book called 10% Happier. So I'm not in the market of peddling miracle cures. I don't think they're, they exist. I mean, if enlightenment is real, I actually think it's it's probably much more complicated on some levels are much less sort of um, sort of candy land as pe people might imagine given the connotations around the word. Um, I kind of think of it like um, enlightenment is like nothing's going to do it to you. Nothing's going to do it for you until everything does it for you. The good, the bad, and the ugly is I think probably my sort of unenlightened mind's a rough attempt to understand what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and so the emotional disturbances aren't going to go away. I mean, the Buddha got into bad moods. He had a rock in his shoe. He didn't like that. He had, when his friends died, he got upset. Um, so for, for And he was kind of negotiating among these warring kings and stuff like that. So he had a tumultuous life. And so I, I really am sort of, as the kids would say, picking up what you're putting down because you do have these organically existing issues you're just not amplifying them in an unconstructive way in your life you're just you're just using them to write music yeah exactly so tell me I, I read a few things i'd love to hear you talk about how you did research for your new album what's the new album called by the way the white album the white album uh you actually joined tinder yeah uh and your wife was cool with that yeah but it was only for research purposes yeah. You hesitated. Well, oh, I mean, I don't know. It's, it somehow feels a little smaller. That I, I, I go out into, into the world to have experiences in order to write songs, but why am I writing songs? Is it, I, I don't know. It's, it just feels like this is my, my path, my path in, in life is, is to to live and have these experiences and then put them into songs. Um, it just feels a uh, so I I, I don't want to sell the whole Tinder experience short um, and say it's it's just for this small practical purpose. It's more like this big mission I'm on. I guess what I was getting at is you weren't doing it for hooking up. Oh no, I can't do that. So you were meeting people on Tinder and just hanging out with them. Yeah. 
Well, the one the one uh, relationship that was proved most useful for um, thank God for girls. Um, I actually didn't even meet her in real life. It was just text relationship. And so you're talking about the song "Thank God for Girls." Yeah. So how did that text relationship feel, help the song? Well, um, there's there's actually lines from our um, correspondence that I used in the um, in the lyrics, and and just the whole the whole idea of and meeting up in real life would cause the illusion to shatter. Um, I I wish that I could get to know her, but meeting up in real life would cause the illusion to shatter. Um, you know, I, there's no way I would have written that without having gone through the, the Tinder experience. And did you actually meet up in real life with some people? And how did you pitch yeah. that? It's like, hey, I'm, I'm in a rock band. I want to hang out and talk. Or, or um, clearly yeah. most people don't join Tinder to meet dudes who are looking to, for inspiration for songwriting. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think my description says... Um, I, I'm just here doing research and looking, looking to make new friends and, and have experiences and uh, not looking to hook up, something like that. And some people, I don't know how Tinder works. This is going to sound like yeah. protesting too much, but it's just, they, <laughs> um, they, t- in order to, they like that or yeah, they, they reply swipe, to that? Yeah, they swipe right, and that's, so then we have a match. And then you just chit chat with them. Yeah. And how did it go when you actually were meeting people IRL? Uh, how did that go, and what what was your goal for those uh, experiences? Um, that's that's really great on tour because I'll be in uh, Indianapolis and I won't know a soul there, and so I can go on Tinder and um, find somebody right around the hotel, and then you know we can go out and they'll show me around the town, and um, it makes for a much richer experience than sitting in the hotel room and watching a movie. For sure. I should tell our podcast listeners that that oh, noise yeah. is the air conditioning in, in your lovely home. You I don't can turn to, that You want to turn it? Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's okay. All right. He's going to go for it. As I look over my questions that I want to ask you. The other thing you did, as I understand it, was um, you just hit a, cl- a click, which will slowly power it down. Is that what's, what's going on? Yeah. The other thing you did is you went to um, the beach. Yeah. Um, well, before, before we even, uh, assembled the first song, uh, we had the idea of the overriding theme, the, uh, that it would be a beach album. So in order to pick up images and visual details, I just spent tons of time at Santa Monica and Venice beach. Just observing. Yeah, observing, walking around, biking, um, hanging out with people. And can you go out in public without being bothered? Yeah. You can? Yep. Because if I saw you in public, I would bother you. I bet you wouldn't. If really? I If I don't have my glasses on and um, I'm just walking around, I bet you wouldn't even recognize me. But that must be... Uh, that's just sort of an incongruence there for me because... I've been watching you on music videos for decades. You play in front of stadiums, screaming people who all know exactly who you are, and yet you can hang out at the beach unmolested. Yeah, um, you know, occasionally I'll get recognized. If I put my glasses on, I get recognized more often. Do you feel like a rock star? I don't know. I mean, I've been once for half of my life, uh, most of my adult life, so I don't know any other reality. Um, I feel like this is what it, this is all I know what it's like to be a, a, a human. When you were in your early twenties and, and, and putting out the blue album and Pinkerton and all that stuff, if you, when you looked at 45 year olds who were still making rock music, did, what did you think of those guys? Did you think they should stop or were you, were you into it? Um, well, I was I was probably very into classical music, and I've I've always had natural um, respect for and attraction to older people. Um, you know, I wasn't crazy necessarily about artists my own age in their early twenties or or younger. Um, I always looked up to the the past masters. Um, that being said, there um, like yeah, there was something kind of distasteful about like older looking people playing 
specifically rock music with those kind of instruments, um, you know, those kind of clothes and stage moves, just didn't, it's kind of distasteful. And yet, here you are. Um, yep. Well, I don't have to look at myself. <laughs> How long do you think you can keep doing this? Until I'm 60. 60? Yep. So you're, you've already got this mapped out. Yep. Uh, what are you going to do at 60? Retire. And just hang out? Uh, I'll do a lot of service at the meditation centers. But that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you'll be putting out Weezer albums through your 50s? Yep. And you don't care like what, uh, what anybody says, you'll just keep doing it? Um, I care what people say, but uh, not to the extent that it would stop me from putting out music. We, you, we mentioned before that your last record, it'll, Everything Will Be All Right in the End, yeah. uh, got really good reviews, yeah. which I know is, and I disagree with this, is, is rare uh, for you. Was that meaningful to you? And will if the next record doesn't get good reviews, will you be upset? I don't think the next record will get as good reviews, but I think they'll still be good. Um, now, yeah, I mean, I love good reviews and I hate bad reviews for sure, but there's nothing I can do about it. No. I think that's <laughs> the only attitude you can have, right? You cannot control how people are going to respond to it. But you, there was a, there, the one record, and I'm just thinking of this, that I think completely gets overlooked is Maladroit. Uh -huh. I think it's a fantastic record that never, doesn't get talked about enough. But the records that when I, I just collected a bunch of articles about you and was reading them, people keep talking about that period of time when you, when you're, you had a little bit of a fan revolt around... Um, green Album? Green or, Album. No, no, not Green Album. The, um, there's pretty much every album there's a fan revolt. I guess. Hurley. <laughs> oh, okay. That, that revolt. I yeah. remember the Hurley revolt. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the record before it, I can't remember what that Ratitude. was. Ratitude. Ratitude and Hurley. Yeah, people got pissed in that area, and I'm not quite sure... Why and but I'm more I'm less interested in that. More interested in how you deal with that and whether meditation is useful in those moments. It is, yeah. I mean, when when uh, fans get upset or the critics get upset, it's like uh, you just feel um, the sick inside and uh, like physically pained. And then uh, you meditate for an hour and it all relaxes and you feel chill again. Do you think it? Does the pain come back or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, it doesn't go away in one sitting for good, for sure. But I would say over the years, um, it bothers me less and less. That is not nothing. Yeah. No, it's, it's a miracle. Yes. I would agree with that. I mean, what it seems to me is, I mean, I kind of view meditation as really like a train training in resilience because in meditation, you have to be super resilient because it's humiliating. You just quote unquote fail over and over again. You try to it's, focus on it's one thing. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah, you're just off. You know, your mind is crazy, bonkers. I mean, if you want definitive, dispos dispositive proof that you're insane, try to meditate, <laughs> right? Because you're just going to go off and off. And, and and even for me, I'm not as haven't been meditating as long as you, but coming up on seven years, and when I try to meditate, it's it's a, it's a circus. Yeah. Um, it's and so you, still for me. Yeah, okay. So, right. Um, there we go. And uh, so it's a training in resilience because you have to just learn how to come back. And that is scalable off the cushion. And I'm hearing in what you're talking about with these reviews because you spend years working on a record. It's your baby. And people say nasty things about it. And you got to get over it somehow. You got to deal with it. And clearly you have because you keep doing more records. Mm hmm. Yep. One other thing I wanted to ask you about that I read about is that, and this has to do with this issues of the issue of your relationships in your life, but you had a reunion with your father. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, tell me a little bit about that? Well, so my parents split up when I was three or four, and uh, I didn't see him much growing up, probably once when I was seven, when I was 11, 16, and then a few times. It's amazing time that you can remember the exact age you were the other times you saw your dad. I have a really good memory for the 70s and 80s. It's weird. But it also speaks to the emotional potence, potency of that departure on his part. And no, honestly, what it is, is um, 
it, there's been times in my life when I've gone back through my life and really um, made accurate records of I when I was where, what was happening, filed thing. I told you, I'm just, uh, before the podcast started, I'm crazy organized on my computer. Um, so I just kind of know where all that stuff happened. And then after, after my mid twenties, I just haven't kept track of that stuff. So I don't know anything about what happened last week, but I know what <laughs> happened when I was seven. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then in my twenties, I saw him a few times when, uh, we were touring through Europe, uh, because he was originally stationed in Germany and then he ended up just living there after he got out of the army. So he joined the army. Yeah. So he went from being in the Zen Center to joining the Army. Well, uh, there, I think there was a, a, a phase in between where he was um, living the wildlife, and then he was born again and joined the Army and became a minister of the Pentecostal Church. And so he's been doing that ever since. And uh, a few years ago, he moved um, back to... Um, the states and he's actually living in the valley here in, in LA so I see him m much more frequently now did you have some anger they had to get over I think I did yeah yeah I remember when I was young I just I, I loved him so much and looked up to him so much and just thought he was the coolest thing ever and it was it was really really painful that he wasn't there how did you get over it Um, I don't know. Just went away eventually. Look, it wasn't it wasn't going to help you or serve you in any way to be angry to have a relationship with him and have and to allow him to have a relationship with his grandchildren is better for everybody, I would imagine. Well, I don't know. I got some good lyrics out of it. <laughs> Which songs? <laughs> well, famously, um, "Say It Ain't So" is is a lot of uh, that's probably one of our biggest, most loved songs. Yeah. It definitely has that theme of like, um, uh, child um, that's been treated unjustly, um, lashing out at a parent, um, and I think a lot of people relate to that. For sure, we are almost out of t out of time. But is there anything else you want to talk about? Like anything else about the new record you want to tell me about your tour? things you're interested in um well first of all i do want to uh say one other thing that uh, i think would be interesting maybe slightly interesting to you is uh the thing about committing to two hours a day the other thing that's a huge help in motivating myself to do that is goenka he doesn't just ask you to sit two hours a day it's a requirement if you want to sit in the long courses every year, which I immediately knew I wanted to get to 20 days, 30, 45, if you want to sit those, you have to, you have to be able to say you've been sitting two hours a day, I think for two years. So from my first course, I, that, that really helped me commit. Cause I knew if I miss a sitting, then I, I can't sit my course. Nobody's doing any accounting on you though. No, but they, it's a question. On the application. And you just don't want to lie. You can't. That's the other requirement is you can't lie. <laughs> you have to keep the five precepts. So from that first course, I, I've done my best to keep the five precepts. Um, but the five precepts are Buddhist, specifically Buddhist precepts. They were no given, lying, no They drinking. were given by the Buddha, yeah. yeah. So, um, so from my first course, also um, somewhat famously, at least in Weezer circles, uh, is, uh, you know... I couldn't have any kind of sexual activity outside of lifelong committed relationships. So for three years, I was completely celibate after that first course. How'd that go? That was tough. Yeah, because I would imagine. Well, I don't want you. To, I don't want to push you into <laughs> uncomfortable territory, but I would imagine in your position that you don't lack um, for options uh, in your job. So it wasn't until you met and married your wife that you were allowed to get back in the game. That's right. Interesting. And you say famous in Weezer circles, so I would imagine people know in Weezer circles that you meditate. Do you have you have have you turned your fans onto it at all? Um, I feel like it's a it's such a personal thing, and it's such a rare thing that 
that a person will feel will get it. Like this is something I wanted. I actually want to do, and it's going to be good for me. Um, and there's not not a huge point in encouraging people. Even for me, it's so hard. Like, and I, I don't want anyone to be in the middle of their ten day course, just utterly miserable, thinking, "Damn it, Rivers." <laughs> <laughs> he he made me come here. This is horrible. <laughs> well, look, there's no way you can do what you've done or, or what anybody who's kind of really into the practice can do without internal propulsion. You can't do it. Yeah. You can't do it for somebody else because it's, as you said, it's just too hard. It's too hard. <laughs> it's cool to meet somebody else is doing it. Um, anything else? This has been really fun for me. Um... I don't know. Like, yeah, um, if you're interested in in um, the centers I go to, it's it's dhamma dot org d h a m m a. Um, and that's where they that's where you can fi- sign up for Goenka retreats. Yeah, ten day course. Classes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> can't think of it. Can't think of it. Are your band mem- bandmates doing it? No. Do you do you remember? I don't know if this is controversial, but. Do you remember that article in Rolling Stone about you guys in 2005 when you were on the cover? Yeah. So I actually know the woman who wrote that. Uh, Vanessa? Vanessa. Yeah, I'll never but, forget her. Yeah, <laughs> well, I would like to hear more about that. Um, not on the record. Not on the record. <laughs> okay, that's your publicist. Uh, not on the record. So did we don't have to talk about her, but what about... Because if you read that article, it seems like you, you are not at all like the person in that article. The, the, the guy I'm sitting with... Six, 11 years later does not at all seem like the person I would be primed to meet mm. if I read that article. Because in the article, it seems like you're not a jerk, but but that you're very specific, kind of an OCD specific, um, and maybe not, your social skills may be slightly different than than others. Yeah. Is that a safe way to describe the way you think you came off in that article? Yeah, definitely. Um so I guess my question is, was the article wrong or have things, have things changed in part because of maturation and meditation? Well, I, I think both. Um, I, I, I was impressed that she managed to um, por- portray me that way, um, given, given what I thought the interview was like, given what I thought I was like. Um, I think at the same time, I think I have changed a lot and I learned a lot from that article, actually. Um, and that's one of the things that has discouraged me from ha- taking any kind of pro- proselytizing tone in an interview. And I'm, I'm, I'm very careful. Not, n- I don't even bring it up. I mean, obviously. The meditation here, thing. Yeah. But the meditation thing wasn't what came through most powerfully in the article. What was it? The wacky world of Weezer? What, 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 came, what came through to you? It was the, 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 the relationships among the band members. And that uh-huh. how there was tension and the, the other guys in the band were like, well, they were referring to you as dude because you had just started meditating, and, the, and that seemed like a pretty big departure from the from the guy who was um, I don't know, like maybe micromanaging a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean that's right when I started, pretty much. Um, that was two two years into my practice, I think. So, you know, they were, and I pro- I probably hadn't seen them in two thousand three, just a little bit in two thousand four. I come back in two thousand five, do that interview. And say, look, guys, I'm a new person. I'm meditating now, and you know they're r- rightfully pretty skeptical. <laughs> because what had you been like before? Well, I I alluded to a little bit at the beginning of this interview, um, but I was re- I'd really bottomed out, and uh, um, you, you can you can probably find some interviews from 2002 where it's or 2001 where um, you know I had fired the man our manager. I was managing the band myself. Um, um, t- I was in a number of lawsuits on behalf of the band. I was just causing all kinds of problems. And uh, what was going on with you? Um, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank. I I, th- I think I'm not. It's, I I just have this instinctual aversion to talking that badly about myself which i think is healthy (laughs) 
So if you want to do, talk if you want to do the research, it's, you can go back. But um, you don't need to talk badly about uh, yourself. That's not my goal. Yeah, I, was, I, 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 I think at the heart of it, it was like this this withering of my um, my life force and my um, creativity, and it caused me to to really grip and um, try to control things, and uh, you know had. The, our our career was so much less secure at that point too. Uh, a failed record, which we had, um, you know, felt like maybe that's it. Mm. So it, ca- it it caused me to to not behave super great. I get it because here's this thing that's like the center of your life, which is your ability to make beautiful music, awesome music, whatever, however you want to describe it. And if you feel like it's slipping away. You can act out in all sorts of crazy ways, especially if you don't have something like grounding you, like marriage, meditation, being mature, whatever. Um, uh, and this is a good way to end it. I think the ending, to the extent that there are endings, uh, is that it seems pretty happy. Yeah. Um, this was awesome. Huge thrill for me to talk to you about both of these subjects, your music, which has been a big part of my life for a long time, and also meditation, which is a huge part of my life as well. So... Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a thrill for me too. I never get to talk about this stuff, so thank, thanks. I'm, 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 I'm amazed and grateful that you, you have this uh, new podcast. Can't wait to see where it goes. I hope I don't screw it up. It's, all, it's on you now. It is, <laughs> and I, I have a track record of screwing things up, so <laughs> let's, let's hope I don't. Uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>